Module 1, Overview of Autoclaves. Why is getting trained on the autoclave you will be using important? Because this training will help ensure your safety while working with this equipment, introduce you, and help make sure the autoclave is properly treated. <laughs> Do you work with any of the following biological samples? Human clinical samples like blood, cell cultures or tissues, bacteria, insects, fungi, even plant matter or soil? And do you use various tools and equipment in your work that need to be decontaminated regularly, like glassware, tools, tubes, etc.? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then it is likely you need to be able to use an autoclave, and this safety video is for you. When items are autoclaved, things are going to get really hot to almost 250 degrees Fahrenheit and become highly pressurized, causing safety hazards. You need to make sure you know how to properly use the autoclave. This includes knowing what personal protective equipment you need to wear and to determine which items can be autoclaved and how to do it right. The history of autoclaves goes back to the late 1600s, where some equipment was designed to effectively incorporate concepts of steam and pressure. Eventually, various endeavors gave rise to Charles Chamberlain's autoclave that has been used in medical and laboratory settings to sterilize contaminated materials since 1879. When functioning optimally, steam autoclaves are superior when it comes to effectively destroying microorganisms, DNA, RNA, and proteins because these units are able to expose contaminated items to high moist heat for a prolonged length of time. To better understand how steam autoclaves work to sterilize materials, let's take a look at a modern large capacity autoclave, such as this one. We can see the door assembly, chamber pressure gauge, jacket pressure gauge, power switch, emergency shutoff switch, and control panel. What we don't see are the boiler, valves, air and water lines, gaskets, and several other parts that make this autoclave work. Once the door is closed and properly sealed, steam enters the chamber and pushes air already in the chamber out through the drain. As steam enters the autoclave, the chamber temperature and pressure rise, but the jacket pressure remains constant. The superheated moist steam decontaminates the contents loaded into the chamber for a predetermined set of time chosen on the control panel. For a successful autoclave run, the specified temperature must be maintained for the appropriate amount of time, which can vary depending on what is being sterilized. Do you recall the relationship between temperature and pressure from high school? This physics law, associated with autoclaves, states that for a fixed mass of gas, in our case water vapor, at a constant volume or chamber, the pressure P is directly proportional to the absolute temperature, T. For example, when you boil water in a sealed container, like a pressure cooker, where the container size is constant, therefore keeping the volume constant, the temperature rises, which also leads to increased pressure inside the container. What you may be thinking is that an autoclave is also a robust and well-engineered pressure cooker, and you are correct. While people still use stovetop pressure cookers to decrease cooking times for beans and sterilize mason jars or baby bottles, Autoclaves in laboratories are used to decontaminate or sterilize various items using both steam and pressure. The reason we mention the high heat and high pressure is because these are also the hazards that must be considered when working near or operating an autoclave. There are a variety of autoclave styles found on the ASU campus, and while they may look slightly different from each other, they operate on the same principle and have several features in common. However, some autoclaves do have greater hazards than others. Always make sure you are properly trained on how to operate the unit you will be using. Let's take a look at the various steps associated with autoclave use and the associated risks in the following modules. Follow on to module two to learn about prepping the autoclave. Module two, preparing for autoclave use. As with all equipment, there is a good way and a bad way to use an autoclave. It is important to be mindful of potential hazards along each step of the way. There are two steps one needs to follow to prepare using an autoclave. The first is to make sure the autoclave is in good working order. The second is to properly prepare materials for autoclaving. Before starting any kind of work in a laboratory, make sure you have the correct clothing 
like closed-toed shoes, pants, and shirt. Also, tie long hair back and make sure to find correctly fitting personal protective equipment, or PPE. This includes gloves, a lab coat that isn't too small or big, and eye protection. Remember, PPE is required at all times when working in the laboratory or with lab equipment. First, inspect the autoclave. Make sure the door gasket is not cracked, torn, or shredded. The gasket must look smooth and pliable. Next, check the drain screen. If the drain screen is blocked with debris, a layer of air may form at the bottom of the autoclave and prevent proper operation. Clean out any debris with caution. Finally, check the log to see if there are notes on malfunctions. If you suspect a problem or are not sure if something is right, contact the responsible person for the autoclave and your supervisor immediately and wait until the autoclave is cleared for use. You should also post a sign on the autoclave that states, do not use, to ensure no one else uses the autoclave until the unit is working properly. Second, prepare materials. Typical items that can be put into an autoclave include glassware, dry items or instruments, solutions and media, and biological or potentially biohazardous materials. Because of the physical hazards, temperature and pressure, not all materials are safe for autoclaving. For example, only autoclave borosilicate glass and make sure there are no cracks in the glass. Additionally, ensure that plastics can withstand autoclave settings and never mix waste materials and do not autoclave flammable, reactive, corrosive, toxic, or radioactive materials, even if it's mixed with biological waste. We'll go over how to prepare each category of goods, the importance of secondary containment in an autoclave rated pan for collection of spills, and how to properly affix autoclave tape, glassware. When preparing glassware for autoclaving, it is important to make sure that the glass is rated for autoclave use, such as borosilicate glass, Many other glass types are not as resistant to thermal changes and may explode due to the quick rise of temperature in an autoclave. Also, it is important to inspect the glassware and make sure there are no cracks, chips, or broken pieces. Glass that has lost its integrity is more likely to shatter in an autoclave. When preparing empty or partially filled glass vessels for autoclaving, maintaining sterility is also of concern. However, Never autoclave glassware when it is sealed or closed completely. Instead, wrap the opening loosely with aluminum foil, or if the bottle has a screw cap, place the cap on so that it is still loose. About a half turn is enough. However, use care when loading glassware into racks and make sure there is space between items so that steam can move along pieces and effectively sterilize items. If you have glassware containing liquids, always use a pan to catch any liquid that may boil over. Dry items. Dry items include instruments, surgical tools, plasticware, and fabrics, and must be placed in a metal or autoclave rated plastic pan or tray. Instruments are often packed inside a self-sealing autoclave envelope, along with a sterilization indicator. Once closed, autoclave tape is affixed to the outside of the package. The packages are then placed into a rack or loosely arranged in an autoclave-resistant pan. If items in this category are contaminated with biohazardous materials, like used pipette tips, petri dishes, or gloves, they must always be in a red biohazard bag and never loose prior to autoclaving. We will go over autoclaving biohazardous materials later. Liquids. If you need to decontaminate or sterilize liquids, such as water or liquid cultures, you must look for cracks and make sure that the primary container is approved for autoclave usage. It is important to also consider the volume of the liquid inside your container. When liquids are heated, they can expand in volume and contents can boil over. Some liquids may superheat, resulting in possible explosion or boil over situation upon agitation. To help prevent a spill inside the autoclave chamber and maintain sterility upon removal from the autoclave, Make sure to loosely cap screw top lids, about a half turn should do, or loosely fit a piece of aluminum or tin foil over the opening, gently securing the covers with autoclave tape. Then place the containers into an appropriate pan. Here's a trick of the trade. If you're autoclaving media or anything other than water, it's a good idea to place about one half to one inch of water into the pan to reduce the chances of burning the waste onto the pan in case there's a boil over. This also provides a way to heat the liquid more thoroughly and evenly. Since liquids take longer to heat than dry goods, the autoclave parameters will be different and the runtime will be considerably longer. Since sterilizing liquids can be inconsistent in any autoclave, make sure you follow sterility check procedures in accordance with your PI or laboratory guidelines. 
Solid biohazards and biohazard bags. When preparing solid biohazardous waste items, make sure that the waste is inside of a red or clear polypropylene autoclave bag that is clearly labeled with biohazard symbol on the outside and is the right size. If you have a small chamber, a large capacity autoclave bag will not fit and the items will not be properly decontaminated. When loading the biohazardous waste, do not overstuff or cram items into the bag. Pack items loosely to allow for steam to flow among items. Also, make sure to not fill the bag completely. You can fill it about two-thirds of the way instead. Bags packed to capacity with biohazardous waste will not properly sterilize, even if all the autoclave operating parameters are followed. Place about 100 milliliters of water into the bag to help with steam decontamination. Gently twist the material above the waste so there is a little opening at the top so the steam can get into the bag. Secure it with a piece of autoclave tape or twist tie. If the autoclave bag is completely sealed during sterilization, the inner temperature of the bag will not be sufficient for decontamination. Finally, place the bag into an autoclave rated pan with shallow sides and put about one inch of water into the pan. As a final note, let's talk about the use of autoclave tape. While it is a good practice, it is important to know that this tape indicates that the autoclave reached the right temperature, but does not confirm how long the temperature was held inside the chamber. To ensure and document successful sterilization, the use of a biological indicator is suggested. Consult with your lab supervisor on what the protocol is for use of biological indicators in your laboratory. To summarize preparing for autoclave use, ensure material is safe for autoclaving. Never mix waste and never autoclave flammable, reactive, corrosive, toxic, or radioactive materials. Glassware must be inspected for cracks prior to autoclaving. Prepare all packaged material suitably. Check for cracks, double check volumes, and screw cap security. Placement of autoclave tape, and or BI. Place items in an autoclave rated secondary container to secure and contain spills and for ease of removal. Make sure steam can penetrate items for proper sterilization. Be sure to ask questions. Communication is key. Follow on to module three to learn about loading the autoclave. Loading an autoclave. Before loading the autoclave, make sure that the autoclave is ready for use by going through the following checklist. One, wear appropriate PPE to protect against scalds and burns. Lab coat, eye protection, heat insulating gloves, and closed toed shoes. Two, ensure the autoclave is okay to use by making sure the inside of the autoclave is empty and clear of spills by checking the drain and making sure it is not clogged, by looking at the most recent entry in the autoclave logbook to make sure there are no errors that have been reported. If there is a receipt printout with the autoclave, make sure there is enough paper for your autoclave run. Ensure that the jacket pressure has the correct readings. Make sure seals and gaskets around the door are secure and intact. If the autoclave is full, contact the last person on the log. If the autoclave is dirty, has a spill, or needs the drain cleared, contact the lab supervisor and make sure the autoclave is clean before use. All autoclave uses should pause until the unit is in proper working order. Be sure that all the materials to be autoclaved are loaded in the autoclave bin or an appropriate rack or other container to reduce chances of spills and improve ease of removing items from the autoclave. Do not overload the autoclave. Leave sufficient room for steam circulation. Note, depending on the materials you are loading, it may be prudent to add water to the pan prior to autoclaving. If you have any questions, be sure to ask your supervisor for guidance. Communication is key. To summarize loading an autoclave, always wear appropriate PPE. Make sure autoclave is operational. Do not overload the autoclave. Secure the door. Communicate about the autoclave. Follow on to module four to learn about operating the autoclave. Operating an autoclave. When operating an autoclave, be sure to follow the steps outlined in your laboratory protocol. However, manuals for operation of the autoclave should be located near the autoclave. The operating protocol will be similar to this step-by-step -step process. Close and lock the door. Choose the appropriate program or cycle to use for the material. 
for example, gravity, liquid, or dry cycle. Consult the autoclave manual or your laboratory SOP for assistance in choosing a cycle. Set appropriate time and temperature if you are using a customized cycle. Be sure you consult your PI and or the manual directions. Start your cycle and fill out the autoclave user log with your contact information if such a log is available. A completed cycle usually takes between one to one and a half hours depending on the type of cycle. Note, it is recommended to check on the autoclave run about 20 minutes in to make sure the autoclave is working properly and reached 121 Celsius per your chosen cycle parameters. Do not attempt to open the door while the autoclave is operating. If problems with your autoclave are perceived, abort the cycle and report it to your PI immediately. Communication is key. To summarize operating an autoclave, make sure the door is locked securely. Select appropriate cycle. Fill out the autoclave user log. Do not attempt to open the door while in operation. Follow on to module five to learn about unloading the autoclave. Unloading an autoclave. The time when most injuries occur in regards to the autoclave is when it is being unloaded. In older units, this is because the interior chamber is still slightly pressurized and pressurized steam is hotter than boiling water. The rush of steam escaping often catches users off guards, sometimes causing burns and may impair vision. To be safe, follow these steps. Ensure that the cycle has completed and both the temperature and pressure have returned to safe range. Look for the chamber pressure to be back at zero. Wearing PPE and with your body and head as far away from the door as possible, slowly begin opening the door, no more than one inch. This will release residual steam and allow pressure within the liquids and containers to normalize. Remember, pressurized steam is hotter than boiling water. The heat of vaporization released upon the condensation of steam causes much severe damage than does the same quantity of boiling water. Also, watch out for the hot metal parts on the autoclave. If applicable, allow the autoclave load to stand for about 10 minutes in the chamber. This will allow steam to clear and trapped air to escape from hot liquids, reducing risk to operator. Cautiously remove items from the autoclave and, if available, place them in an area which clearly indicates the items are hot until the items cool to room temperature. Note, do not agitate containers of superheated liquids or remove caps before unloading. Shut autoclave door, but do not let it pressurize. Sign the autoclave logbook as a successful run or note if there was a spill or if the autoclave malfunctioned in any way. Immediately notify the supervisor if there was a problem with the run. If waste was in the autoclave, note that all biohazardous material must be processed according to the ASU guidelines. See the following for more information. To summarize unloading an autoclave, make sure the cycle is completed. Wear the appropriate PPE. Slowly open the door with face away from opening. Let items stand in the autoclave for approximately 10 minutes. Cautiously remove items and let cool. Close autoclave door. Sign the autoclave logbook. Dispose of waste properly. If you have any questions about this autoclave safety training video, please contact EHS Biosafety at 480 965 1823 or email biosafety at asu.edu.